Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Atsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode number 116 of ADHD for Smartass Women. This has been a great week. You know, I honestly never expected that my free master series, Five Days to Fall in Love with Your ADHD Brain, would be so impactful to so many, but also so much work. (laughs) Um, I am never exhausted, but I got to tell you, I was exhausted, you know, beyond the physical challenges of creating that much content and delivering it live for 11 days. So I'm ADHD, right? So the five days ended up being 11 days. There was um, this real emotional part of it. You know, here I was getting out on a real limb claiming I could get you to fall in love with your ADHD brain in five days. And I knew I could do it. I'd done it before, but imposter syndrome, right? Yeah, I definitely run into it at times. So I am no different than you are. I just think it's part of my ADHD. And I will also offer that I wouldn't give it up because it's that part of my ADHD brain that causes me to over deliver, right? To constantly up the ante, to make sure that things are always better because things can always be better. So in that way, I actually think imposter syndrome sometimes helps me. So the long and short of it is that since it was so impactful, how can I not do it again, right? What really got me were the women that messaged that with COVID, they had lost their jobs, so they couldn't afford to do anything that wasn't free. And I got to tell you, those comments gave me so much positive emotion and gold stars because it totally fits into my purpose, which is to show ADHD women who they are and inspire them to be it. And knowing that money would have prevented them from being able to participate just felt really good. So I decided that I needed to come here and build some accountability rails for myself. And I wanted to announce that if you missed five days to fall in love with your ADHD brain, or let's say you were so busy that you couldn't give it your full attention, I am going to do it again towards the end of June. So you'll hear more about that. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you all for your lovely, lovely comments. They literally made my last two weeks, okay? And I need the accountability because, you know, I'll let myself down on dates and deadlines, but I'll never let you down. I may be a little late, but I will ultimately show up. And it's got to be easier running this the second time rather than the first, don't you think? I just I just hate tech so much. It's almost like how many times can we test things and have other people test things, too? Right. And there's always something. And I think that's just the nature of the animal. That's just what online anything is today. So today I am going to talk about ADHD and OCD. You know, one of the things that I've loved about these last two weeks is I've had so much more time to do what I really love, which is research subjects for this podcast. Now, 
I'm kind of recording this pretty late. It is Monday evening. And normally I have my podcasts, you know, I do a lot of batch recording. So I have my podcasts in the can many weeks before they're due. This is not one of those times. I'm recording on Monday night. It is 6, 10 p.m. And I just loved the subject of ADHD and OCD. And I don't really know why, but I did. And I want to do more research on it, but I am up against the clock. And so I'm just going to have to go with what I have, but I'll probably do a part two because I just really love this subject. So let me tell you why I decided that I had to dive into ADHD and OCD, because you might be thinking, I'm not OCD. This doesn't apply to me because that's what I was thinking. Well, guess what? I think that after this research, hmm. I definitely might be on that spectrum, that OCD spectrum. And I never thought of it, you know, but it makes so much sense to my life when I'm going back and thinking on it. So, so stick with me because you may be just like me. You remember that podcast I did on ADHD and repetitive body focused behaviors? It was early on in the podcast. I think it's episode 34. And I got so much email and messages um, on that particular podcast because I think that there were a lot of things that we do that we never thought were linked to ADHD. Well, and they're not only related to ADHD, but they're related to OCD and I said this in episode 34, but that didn't really click with me. Like I, I, it didn't really sink in, which I'll get into in a bit. But first, let's talk a little bit just to remind you on what repetitive body focused behaviors are. They call them RBFBs. So RBFBs are related to self-grooming, anxiety management, or sensory stimulation. For me personally, I feel like it's both Anxiety and stimulation, meaning that when I do them, it's a way to manage my anxiety and also manage or maintain my focus. So I'm not sure if that made sense. So I guess what I should have said is for me personally, I feel like RBFBs are a way to manage my anxiety, but they're also a way to stimulate my, my focus. They, they help me focus. So the most common RBFBs, are, okay, here I'm going to massacre these names, trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, you know, either your hair or your eyelashes, dermatillomania, which is skin picking, mm. onychophagia, I should just call it nail biting, huh? Dermatophagia, skin biting, teeth grinding, which is bruxism, tongue biting, I can't say that, Morsicaccio linguarum. <laughs> oh, bad, I know. Sorry. These are complex conditions that cause people to repeatedly touch their hair and body in ways that actually result in physical damage. And they feel like bad habits, but they are technically not habits. So doing any of these grooming behaviors occasionally is normal, but when they become excessive and they negatively impact a person's life, they actually need professional treatment. And although most of us that, you know, engage in these RBFBs, we want to stop these behaviors, but we literally can't. There's almost an addiction like quality to them. And some of us, we're not even aware that we're doing them when we're doing them. So usually these behaviors begin with a desire to remove an unwanted stimulus. So I don't know, blackheads or pimples on your face that you see, a hangnail that you feel, a bump on your arm that you feel. Actually, I guess blackheads and pimples, you would feel those too, right? I don't know, you're, you know, you're in your hair, you're chewing a fingernail. The thing about it is you can actually do physical damage to yourself, right? If you're marking up your face or you're chewing on your nails or fingers or you're pulling out your hair or your eyelashes, you're biting the inside of your mouth, you're likely to leave scars, bald spots and no longer have any nail beds, right? If you keep biting your nails and picking at your nails. But this is the thing. We know this and yet it's still impossible to stop. And some people even end up with stomach problems from this. I still remember when I was studying for the bar and I took the bar exam and I was waiting for the results. And um, my big problem was picking at my skin. So it's not a problem, you know, when you don't have skin to pick, 
But when you're younger <laughs> and you're dealing with acne, you do. And I still remember by the time I got my bar results, my skin was such a mess. And it was just how I was dealing with my anxiety. And so I, I guess that's what made me really realize that it was a way to reduce anxiety. But then I also notice I'll do it when I'm trying to focus. So when I'm trying to study, read, you know, get through a ream of material, um, write, I can find myself constantly either picking at my nails, hang nails. I used to bite my nails when I was um, a teenager, but probably, oh, I don't know, when I was maybe 14 or 15, I stopped doing that. But lately, what I realized that I'm doing is I'm picking at hang nails, which I never did before. And it's interesting to me because when I'm really stressed, I tend to do it less. And now it's more a way to focus. So when I'm trying to get through work where I find that I'm picking at my nails. So just like I mentioned in episode 34, the expert on repetitive body focused behaviors, wait, what's it called? Repetitive body focused behaviors <laughs> and OCD that is most cited is Dr. Roberto Olivardia. He's brilliant. He teaches at Harvard and I especially love him because he also has ADHD. I've learned so much from him, not only about RBFBs and OCD, but also I'm trying to remember what was the subject that, oh, cannabis. Yeah, he, he just, he's amazing. So I highly recommend if you can read anything that he has written about OCD, ADHD, cannabis, do it. So now that you have an idea what RBFBs are, let's talk a bit about what OCD is, because this is the first time I've ever talked about it, really, um, on this podcast. So OCD stands for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And just like when you hear someone say, oh, I'm so ADHD, you know, who's talking about the fact that their working memory glitched one time when it's normal, <laughs> saying, oh, I'm so OCD because you like things neat and organized, it's probably equally as obnoxious, right, as saying, oh, I'm so ADHD because you have no idea how debilitating OCD can be. You know, Dr. Olivardia, he shares a story about one of his clients who was married and um, his marriage broke up over the fact that he, the husband, required that his family, well, it wasn't just this, I'm sure it was other things, but this was one of the instances where he would require that his family strip down outside of the house, put their clothes in a bag, the clothes had to be thrown in the washing machine immediately, and they could only use some sort of special, very expensive organic detergent that had been flown in from Europe. I mean, can you imagine if that's your life? Yeah, it would be really debilitating. So what exactly is obsessive compulsive disorder? Well, it is a neurological and behavioral condition that affects more than 2 million people in the United States. So one in 100 adults and one in 200 children. ADHD and OCD are two of the most commonly diagnosed neuropsychiatric conditions. OCD typically has two parts. You have the first part, which is obsessions. So they are recurrent and unwanted thoughts. And or part two is the compulsion. So those are repetitive behaviors. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but you can just have the obsessions without having the compulsions, but typically you have both of them. So what are obsessions? Obsessions can be repetitive words. They can be thoughts, fears, worries, memories. They can be pictures in your head, right? The ones we typically think about when we hear the word OCD are people who are terrified of germs. You know, they're germaphobes, right? They're constantly cleaning. They're scared to touch anything. They might be scared to touch other people. Right away, I think of Howard Hughes and Howie Mandel. Other obsessions can be becoming ill or dying. So you have a fear of losing control and causing harm either to yourself or to other people. Obsessions can also be perverse sexual thoughts. They can be violent thoughts. You can imagine how terrifying those would be, both of them. They can be religious obsessions, a fear of offending God. Perfectionism, you can have an extreme need for order, symmetry, or perfection. You know, you think of these people, they're, they're difficult. They can even be eccentric. Sorry, there went my Alexa, announcing that I have a shipment from Amazon. <laughs> okay, so people with OCD often understand that these obsessions are extreme or unnecessary, 
but they can't control or stop them. So they get how crazy this all sounds. They still can't do anything about it to stop them. So I said, OCD is obsessions and or compulsions. So what are the compulsions? Compulsions are the behaviors that people with OCD do in an attempt to calm their anxiety over their obsessions. So what it is they're thinking about, right? Compulsions can be cleaning and or washing. So excessive cleaning, washing hands, refusing to touch other people, refusing to touch doorknobs, refusing to use a public restroom. It can be counting or repeating, repeatedly touching, counting or rearranging objects. Compulsions can be checking or questioning, right? You're constantly checking that the stove has been turned off, that you lock the doors, that someone you're worried about is okay. Compulsions can be arranging and organizing. This can look like perfectionism, the need to organize toys a certain way, your living space a certain way, and you can become really upset if anything changes. You may have a certain way that you have to dress or undress, meaning that it's, everything is done in a certain order. And if you don't do it in that certain order, then you have you know, so much anxiety over it. Compulsions can be hoarding or collecting, saving items because there's a belief that they're important and they can't be thrown away. And this isn't, you know, saving items of value. This can be saving items like old napkins, used band-aids, you know, paper towels. Compulsions can be repetitive body-focused behaviors. Ding, 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 right? Behaviors that must be done even if it hurts. Biting your nails, picking at cuticles, picking your skin, pulling out your hair, eyebrows and eyelashes. Compulsions can also be mental acts like praying or having to repeat certain words to yourself. And then you have rules that if you don't do this, something bad is going to happen. I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but you know, you're walking on the sidewalk and you can't step on a crack. Things like this, right? They can have absolutely nothing to do with the obsession. So you can be walking on that sidewalk saying, if I don't, if I step on any crack, my husband's going to die or my parents are going to die. Again, these compulsions have absolutely nothing to do with this obsession, right? Of worrying about your parents going to die or that your parents might die or that your spouse may die. Not stepping on a crack has nothing to do with keeping them safe, right? So the obsession has nothing to do with the compulsion. So it's all about trying to prevent some terrible situation that's not really real from happening. Look, you can have compulsions where you just feel driven to do something without an obsession, right? It comes out of nowhere. And that can be OCD too. But usually there is an obsession first. And then the compulsion's purpose is to reduce that bad thing from happening, at least in your brain, right? In your thoughts. You're trying to neutralize that obsessive thought, impulse, or image by employing these repetitive behaviors, and it's not just if I walk out of the bathroom and I touch that doorknob, I may get germs. No, I mean, that's common sense, right? You may get germs if you touch a doorknob when you walk out of the bathroom. But it's so much worse than that. It's if I touch that doorknob, I'm going to die. So in order to not die, I have to wash my hands 10 times and perhaps do all kinds of other rituals that honestly don't make sense. Like, I don't know, say 10 our fathers in order not to die. And not doing these things, not, you know, going through that process of washing your hands 10 times and then saying 10 our fathers is going to increase your anxiety, right? So you do it to decrease your anxiety, but doing them only provides temporary relief. So it's just a matter of, you know, a couple of minutes or maybe an hour when you start feeling the same way about something else. So, um, What I also learned is that there is something called the OCD spectrum. I never heard of this. And the OCD spectrum covers a collection of disorders and conditions that have a genetic underlying trait of obsessionality and compulsivity. And those include hoarding, which we just talked about, tics, Tourette's disorder, body focused repetitive behaviors, so they're connected to OCD and body dysmorphic disorder. OCD 
is not worrying about washing your hands or practicing physical distancing or wearing a mask because of COVID or caring that your physical space is clean. These are real life problems. It's like ADHD, right? Everyone struggles with symptoms that are ADHD-like at times. They forget what they walked into a room for. They struggle to start. They procrastinate. But it's when it gets to the point where these symptoms interfere with your daily life that you really need to take a look and see, okay, so what is this ADHD all about, right? And it's the same thing for OCD. Not all repetitive behavior rituals or routines are compulsions. Routine and structure, it can be really helpful, right? For those of us with ADHD. So how do you know, is it OCD? Is it ADHD? Or could it possibly be both? So OCD can often be misdiagnosed for ADHD and ADHD can be misdiagnosed as OCD. There are symptoms that overlap, but they can also be comorbid, meaning you can have both. Remember, 50 to 80% of all of us with ADHD have one or another related comorbid conditions like anxiety, depression, or OCD. After I say that, when I think about it, I'm not sure that I've ever even met anyone who just has pure ADHD. There always seems to be something else going on. ADHD and OCD is actually fairly common. Statistics indicate that somewhere between, I'd say 25 and 30% of those diagnosed with OCD also have ADHD. I've also seen numbers as high as um, 40%. What I haven't seen are studies though, that, um, so, so they look at people in, in this particular you know, studies, they look at people with OCD to see what percentage have ADHD. I have not really seen any studies where they're looking at people with ADHD to see what percentage have OCD. But just like with ADHD, there's a strong genetic component. It runs in families. You know, you may not see OCD specifically, but you will often see a family member with another disorder that is on that OCD spectrum. And again, that includes, you know, disordered eating, trichotillomania, dermatillomania, so um, hair pulling, skin picking, panic disorder, hoarding, Tourette's, ASD, social anxiety, et cetera. And I'll get into this a little bit more in a bit. You can also have pure obsession. You know how I said that you can have obsessions without also having compulsions? They call that pure O, where there is no compulsion, just constant obsessive thought and thinking. And this often doesn't get diagnosed as OCD, but instead it's misdiagnosed as anxiety because you've got all these thoughts, but you're not building strange behaviors around them, right? This, this pure O or pure obsession is also OCD. So there's two times that we typically see OCD in people. We see, you know, it show up around the ages of eight to 12, and then again in the late teens and early adulthood. Beyond genetics, we know it's genetic, we really don't know what causes OCD, but research reveals that there is an abnormal activity in certain regions of the brain for both ADHD and OCD. For OCD, you see increased activity in these certain brain regions. For ADHD, you see decreased activity in these same brain regions. And it's believed that it's a deficiency of the neurotransmitter serotonin that causes OCD and a deficiency in the neurotransmitter dopamine and norepinephrine for ADHD. In severe cases of OCD where obsessive thoughts lock, I can't even imagine this. So that means you can't relieve them. New research indicates that it's more than just a deficiency of serotonin. So there's something else that's going on. So ADHD and OCD, it may look like two completely different conditions, right? ADHDers were generally spontaneous and impulsive and we're oriented towards pleasure. We are high stimulation people. OCDers on the other hand are methodical and plotting and they're compulsive. They think way too much before acting and every decision has this great weight to it. They do everything to avoid risky or potentially harmful situations. And those with OCD, they're overly concerned with the consequences of their actions, and they tend not to act impulsively, right? 
But let's talk about executive functions, which are challenged with both ADHD and OCD. So that is where we see some similarity. Now, executive functions, if you recall, they're the mental processes. I talk about it all the time on this podcast. They're the mental processes that help us to plan and focus attention and juggle multiple tasks and exhibit self-control. They affect working memory, time management, organization. So if you have OCD and you are constantly worried about what you see as threatening or distressing, which is where the OCD brain always goes, you know, the anxiety is over looking out. And I wonder if what it is, is they just have a larger amygdala, right? They're, so when you look at, like, I talk about the um, hunter versus farmer theory of ADHD, where those of us with ADHD, we are just left over hunters living in a farmer society. I suppose you could say that those with OCD are much more farmer-like and those of us with ADHD are much more hunter-like. So it really looks like, oh my gosh, we are just worlds apart, right? But again, if you have OCD and you're constantly worried about what you see as threatening or distressing, doesn't it make sense that you'd have trouble paying attention? You'd have trouble organizing and exhibiting self-control, right? You'd have problems with your executive functions because you pay much too much attention to whatever you regard as a threat. What happens to OCDers is they can't filter out those obsessive thoughts. And how could that not be distracting? So it almost sounds like ADHD and OCD, when you describe them, they're like opposites, right, on a spectrum. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second, too, which is just fascinating to me. So when you think about hoarding, which is, you know, in that OCD family, you have to look at, because you can have hoarding for ADHD reasons, but you can also have hoarding as the result of OCD, right? Right. People with more ADHD challenges around hoarding, it's because we're impulsive, right? We're buying stuff all the time, but we're actually bothered by the mess around us. It's distracting. The clutter makes our symptoms worse. And we save things because I, I do this all the time. Like I want to throw things away, but I will often save things because the thought of, oh my gosh, I know I'm going to need that, even if it's 10 years down the road, and I don't even want to have to deal with finding what model do I buy, getting it here, you know, all of that stuff. So it's taxing on our executive functions versus those who are hoarding with OCD. They're not impulsive. The hoarding is more around saving, and they're not usually as bothered by the clutter they don't even really notice it, right? It's other people who come to them who are like, oh, I think there's a problem here. There's a sense of morality among those with OCD and hoarding and also a personification of objects. So they equate throwing things out with being wasteful, which makes them feel bad and is that they are bad people. So for them, wastefulness, it's a character flaw. So how do you treat OCD? Well, if there's ADHD and even if there's not, it's just so important to see a professional who specializes in treating more than one disorder because of the high rate of comorbidity. You know, OCD is typically treated with a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy, specifically something called exposure response prevention therapy, ERP for short, or the acronym, and a non-stimulant medication such as an SSRI, which of course increases serotonin in the brain. ERP involves confronting whatever situation or thought is making a person anxious. This means that if you're obsessing over getting sick from touching doorknobs, what the therapist is going to do is they're going to have you put your hands on the toilet seat in a public bathroom for a certain amount of time, and then you can't wash your hands for an hour. Yeah, you can imagine how hard that would be. What you're basically doing is you're forcing your body and brain to be in the middle of it, right, until you can learn to tolerate it. Stimulant medication also seems to exacerbate OCD, and it may be the first clue that for an ADHD patient, OCD is also present. It makes sense, doesn't it? So you put someone with OCD on stimulant medication, what's it going to do? It's going to increase their attention and focus. So why wouldn't someone with comorbid OCD or no ADHD at all focus even more on their obsessive thoughts. It, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So if there's ADHD and OCD, 
you need to treat the OCD first. And once the OCD is under control, usually stimulant medication can be reintroduced without causing the OCD symptoms to increase. So just like with an ADHD professional, you wanna make sure that you're working with medical professionals that have worked with many patients with comorbidities so that we know that nothing's missed, right? In this case, you want an expert that has treated many patients with both ADHD and OCD. Sadly, when people have both ADHD and OCD, one of these conditions is normally missed. And this is for a number of reasons. Number one, medical professionals, they just don't realize that ADHD follows you into adulthood, that adults have ADHD. Number two, they don't know what inattentive ADHD looks like. So if you're an inattentive, you know, the ADHD is not going to come up because you're not hyperactive. And everybody thinks that in order to have ADHD, it means you have to be hyperactive. Number three, the usual, right? If you did well in school, if you have a successful career, you can't possibly have ADHD. Number four, sometimes symptoms of ADHD and OCD, they mimic each other. So you want to ask the patient or the client, what are they actually thinking? You know, why are they organizing and meticulously cleaning everything? Is it a form of procrastination or because they get too distracted if things are a mess and they can't focus? Or are there obsessions that they're trying to relieve? Number five, one of the things that can happen with school-aged kids is that they're not paying attention in class and teachers are the ones that are filling out the forms to screen for ADHD. So they interpret inattention and poor classroom performance as ADHD. No one is asking the child or the student what they're thinking, right? Maybe it's fear that they didn't check the stove when they left for school and they're worried that their carelessness is gonna kill their parent or their younger sibling if that's one of their obsessions or they're worried that everything on their desk has to be organized just so and has to be counted 10 times before they can start. This was something that my son struggled with in fourth grade. Thankfully, it's it's no longer, it, you know, it no longer seems to be one of his problems. But I remember, you know, he was struggling in class, but part of what he was struggling with was the time it took for him to make sure that everything was counted and everything was in the right order before he started on a test, you know, that was timed. Number six, many of us also need conditions just so in order for us to focus and get our work done. And when I say many of us, I mean those of us with ADHD, right? We have a certain way that we need to work in order for our focus to be um, at its optimum. And so we're trying to get that perfect environment so we can get done what we need to get done. But it could also be perfectionism OCD, which is more about the desire, right, to achieve a moral right, meaning that if it's not perfect, we're not a good human being. Number seven, you'll also see distractibility in OCD and ADHD. We have the distractibility that we're familiar with with ADHD, right? We have these brains of interest. You know, we like new, we like novel, we can do that squirrel thing. But for the person with OCD, they are likely distracted by their thoughts and if it's not their thoughts, they're looking for a way to be distracted just to get out of their head. Number eight, there's a difference between hyperfocus and overfocus, right? Hyperfocus is what those of us with ADHD engage in, where we're so productive and we're so focused because we're working on something that we're really interested in, versus Overfocus is what OCDers can get stuck and paralyzed in. They're so focused on their obsessions that they can't get anything else done. Number nine, there's also a misconception around OCD that everyone with OCD is a perfectionist. Everyone with OCD is neat as a pen, is rigid around everything being perfect when that is in fact not true, right? We know that hoarding is a type of OCD. So Attitude Magazine has a screener on, is it OCD or is it not? And I'm gonna read for you some of the questions and I'll also post the link to this screener in our show notes. And you can find it on my podcast website, which is at tracyoutsuga.com forward slash podcast. So the deal is, according to the screener, if you answered yes to five or more of these questions, and the behaviors are causing you significant distress, you may have OCD, so you might want to get an evaluation. Number one, do you get caught up making sure things are in their proper order? Are you constantly rearranging drawers, lining up silverware on the table, etc.? 
Number two, do you have personal unacceptable thoughts, often of a religious or sexual nature that feel intrusive and out of your control? Number three, do you collect useless objects or inspect the trash before it gets thrown out to see if you missed anything? Number four, do you feel a need to confess or constantly seek reassurance on something you said or did? Number five, are you concerned about being contaminated by germs, chemicals, or diseases? Number six, do you worry about harm coming to someone you love because you weren't careful enough? Number seven, do you unnecessarily reread letters, emails, or text messages before or after you've sent them? Okay, so that's one that I have to mark yes to, but I think that's ADHD because, you know, all it takes is one time sending a message to the wrong person where you're talking about them to someone else to forever, you know, make sure that you check every single email that goes out. So I am always double checking and triple checking my messages. First of all, that they're going to the right person, but also just to make sure that I haven't missed, you know, misspelled a word or, you know, I'm saying the wrong thing or it doesn't make sense because, you know, to me, that's what our ADHD brains do, right? Number eight, do you constantly worry about losing something that is valuable to you? Number nine, do you perform ritualized washing, cleaning, or grooming rituals? So you're washing your hands five times in a row, for example. Number 10, do you have upsetting mental images of death, destruction, or other unpleasant events? Number 11, do you often examine your body for signs of illness? Number 12, do you repeat routine actions like opening a door, lighting a cigarette, or getting into bed? over and over again until it feels right. Number 13, do you worry about acting on a senseless urge like pushing a stranger in front of a bus or driving your car into oncoming traffic? I say yes on that one. You know, everybody loves the Grand Canyon, right? To me, the Grand Canyon was hell. I was there with my family and the whole time, you know, there were no rails or blocks between the Grand Canyon and where you stand to view the Grand Canyon. And I have never felt as much anxiety as when I was at the Grand Canyon, because just the thought of how easy it would be to just push someone just a little tap and they could fall to their death. It to this day, it just gives me anxiety even thinking about it. And I remember my son, he thought it was funny to just go as close to the border as he could. And part of it was, oh my gosh, he's going to fall in. And then the other part of it was, oh my gosh, it would be so easy to just push him and he'd be gone. You know, so those kinds of thoughts, you know, I've experienced those kinds of thoughts too. Like, you know, in New York City, you know, in the subway where it would just be so easy to just push, right? And you push someone into the oncoming train. Now, would I ever do that? No. And I know I wouldn't do it, but just having those kinds of thoughts are just so uncomfortable. So I would say yes to that one. So I've got two now. Number 14, do you avoid things that are certain colors or numbers because you view them as unlucky or evil? Number 15, do you check things like oven knobs, door locks, and car handbrakes over and over again? I would say yes to that one as well. Probably more things like the oven or the water um, because Every time I turn on the water to fill up this certain teapot, I forget and it just goes all over the place. So I think a lot of the checking is related to ADHD versus OCD. I mean, there is a reason why I would check things over and over again, because I've been known to, you know, screw up and not realize that things are still on. Number 16, do you excessively worry about things like fires, car accidents, or your house getting flooded? Number 17, do you worry about spreading an illness, even if you have never been diagnosed with the illness? So again, the deal is if you answered yes to five or more questions and the behaviors are causing you significant distress, you may have OCD, so you might want to get an evaluation. So the other noteworthy thing I noticed about OCD that I wanted to mention is that one in five kids with OCD has comorbid ADHD, but only one out of every 12 adults with OCD has comorbid ADHD. So what's happened to the ADHD in the adults? Like, where did it go? Are they cured? Well, based on some research that I saw, it appears that 
pre-adolescent children with OCD, they go through a slower process of brain development in which they may have what looks like ADHD symptoms in childhood. But these seem to dissipate and their brain activity changes to fit the adult patterns observed in adult OCD. They also suspect that a full-blown dual diagnosis of ADHD and OCD in adults, that that may in fact be rather rare. I suspect that perhaps it's ADHD and then we're kind of on that OCD spectrum, right? So this part is especially fascinating to me, so I want to share it with you. There is research that suggests that OCD and obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders fall upon a compulsive impulsive continuum. So you have OCD, let's say on the left-hand side, and then you have ADHD all the way to the far right. So the question is, if that's true, how can we be both impulsive and careful? How can we be risk takers and also avoid risk? Remember that there's an abnormal activity in certain regions of the brain for both ADHD and OCD, and they're in opposite areas, right? So for OCD, you see increased activity in certain brain regions. For ADHD, you see decreased activity in those same regions of the brain. And so I think the answer is that, yes, you can have ADHD and comorbid OCD. So I'll post all the links and resources again. Um, it'll be on my podcast page, tracyatsuka.com forward slash podcast. Um, so there was one article that I was reading. And what they said is when patients were studied, it was noted that for people with OCD, only an increase in reported obsessive compulsive thoughts and behaviors also meant a decrease in performance on executive function tests. But get this, but for those with ADHD and OCD, more obsessive compulsive symptoms correlated with better performance in tests of executive functions. And this might be because those with ADHD who also exhibit obsessive compulsive traits are much better organized and attentive to details than individuals with ADHD who exhibit no obsessive compulsive symptoms. Bingo. You know, I have said this for a while now, that those who are the most successful with their ADHD are women, because I work with women, right? Are women who either don't have major trauma or have addressed it and, big and, have a bit of OCD anxiety. This makes so much sense to me. You know, I've always said that in certain instances, I am extremely impulsive. For example, with my mouth. I shoot my mouth off regularly. I say what people think. And I often don't even understand. Like my daughter will make comments about, oh my gosh, mom, I can't believe you said that. I don't even see <laughs> my words as being impulsive. Like I don't see what she sees as so, I guess, shooting my mouth off, right? I also, I don't have issues with staring down fear, starting businesses, I'm driven. So I'm all out impulsive in certain areas, but then in other areas, I don't have those typical hyperactive impulsive ADHD tendencies. I just don't. I am very careful about my physical safety. I have no desire to jump out of planes. I have no desire to hel helicopter ski. I have no desire to rock climb. I don't even want to drive fast. In those ways, I am a total and complete grandma. I do not like having my body feel out of control. And we hear the statistics about ADHD and the high rates of teen pregnancy and addiction and felonious driving, and that is just not my thing. In fact, my friends used to make fun of me because I was so not promiscuous. There was no way there was ever going to be a teen pregnancy. You know, they were all sleeping around at the drop of a hat and I was just not going there, which is funny because I've always joked about being a man trapped in a woman's body. So it wasn't that I wasn't interested. It's that I wasn't going to put myself in a position where the result of my actions down the road would have been well outside of my comfort zone and ability to deal. I knew what my limitations were and what I could handle. And perhaps that's too much information, but hey, 
That's my podcast, right? <laughs> or this is my podcast. So I've always wondered how could I be so impulsive in some of my decision making, but so cautious in others? How can I be such a risk taker in some areas and such a risk avoider in others? Now I have an idea how. It's my brain. I'm ADHD and I'm probably on the OCD spectrum. In any case, OCD needs to be taken seriously. Without treatment, it leads to low self-esteem, depression, substance abuse, relationship problems, school, and job failure. If you suspect that it's not just ADHD, but maybe it's OCD too, or maybe the ADHD, you starting to think it's misdiagnosed and it's sounding more like OCD, get yourself a trained medical expert who is familiar with not only ADHD, but also all of the comorbidities. And also, you know, for this podcast, especially if you have any thoughts around this, or if you share my experiences, I would love to hear from you. Okay. As always, you're listening to ADHD for smart ass women. Can you hear the frog? So I named our property here, Bullfrog Farms, because, well, we lived here, I don't even know how many years, but several years. And we have a, an acre and a half pond. I think I may have told the story before. And we have these Canada geese that fly in. But we were such city slickers. We came from San Francisco that we did not know that the sound that the Canada geese make is very different than the sound of the bullfrog. And so one day I was walking up to the pond and I looked over and I jumped because I heard this boom, boom. And I look down and there's this giant bullfrog with, with its neck all distended. So we called the property Bullfrog Farms, but you probably just heard one of the frogs just went off. He's somewhere in the house. We can't find him. There must be an area that they can get into from outside, but somehow, you know, they're not quite in the house, but we can hear them. And so that's probably what you were hearing was that little frog going. Ah, I was silent for a second thinking maybe he might come back. Anyway. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this podcast, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too can discover their amazing strengths. And your reviews, they really do help in that regard. For me, they're like those little gold stars we used to get on our work when we were kids. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is a OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.